Welcome to Section 230 in the Defense of Free Speech. So I would hope to think that whether you have already educated yourself um, to a high degree on this or you just popped in to see what the heck is everyone even talking about with this, um, you'll get something out of this. So um, I, I think we can leave some time at the end for questions, I hope. Um, so don't be afraid. If you're new to it or you are writing an amicus brief to the Supreme Court this year, let's do this thing. Um, I have with me, in no particular order because where we sat doesn't match my cards, <laughs> um, I have uh, Ford Fisher, independent journalist and filmmaker. Yep. Is that correct? You're allowed <laughs> no, to correct, correct me because I just made this up from the interwebs. Test, um, test. And from what I know about you, so you can, you ha you'll have time to reply and <laughs> argue. Um, Connor Boyack, who is, like I was saying, basically Elvis, this yeah. event. Is that fair to say? <laughs> I've never listened to an Elvis song, so I'll have to take what? your word for it. Maybe uh, later. President of Libertas Institute, but let's be honest, it's about the books. It's about, yeah, Tuttle Twins, kids' books, you guys saw Jaden on stage. Our goal is to make a million more Jadens like that in our, our country, so. Okay, well, I don't want to see how the sausage is made, but I love where your head's at. Okay, Topher Fields. Just talking about making more children, I feel like. Uh, Topher Fields, um, human rights activist and enemy of the state? Is that yeah. in Australian? I'm going to throw well, that in. Well, basically, yes, and uh, almost very nearly not allowed into the US because I only just finished my latest round of criminal charges on the 19th of January. We're going to get into that, so stick around. It's going to get spicy. Yeah, it's going to get spicy in here. But, Connor, I'm going to make you go first and just tell us in broad strokes what is Section 230? How did it come to be? And what, what did it cause in terms of social media's current existence and formation? Okay, so this started in the 1990s. There was a pair of lawsuits against a couple of communication providers, uh, basically the, the proto-internet early days. And uh, these lawsuits produced two different uh, legal opinions. One in which they said that the platform provider should be held accountable for the speech on their platform, and the other analysis saying the opposite. So there was kind of a conflicting interpretation of how to hold the platforms responsible. Should they be publishers of content and therefore held accountable like traditional publishers, uh, or should they be seen more as distributors where it's not their ideas, they're just a, an ecosystem letting other people do whatever they want. Uh, the result of that was the Communications Decency Act of 1996, which is where in section 230 of the law, it's actually 230 sub C sub 1, uh, where uh, we get the sec what we all talk about as section 230. It's a, it's a little subsection of, of 230 in the law. Uh, this is sometimes called the 26 words that created the internet. Uh, and I'll read them. I, I, I didn't memorize them, so I got them here. Uh, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. In layman's terms, that means that Facebook, as an example, can't be held responsible as the publisher of my content when I go in there and preach anarchy or whatever, right? It's not, it's my words, it's not theirs. And so uh, to your latter question, uh, this has really allowed the internet to flourish. This has allowed for these social ecosystems and speech platforms to allow people to be their own publishers. And it's given legal immunity to these companies uh, so that they are not held legally responsible for any of the hate speech or misinformation or whatever on their platforms. The final thing I'll say is that in subsection C2, there's a Good Samaritan provision as well for these companies so that if they in good faith are trying to moderate content that's you know vicious illegal problematic whatever uh, they get they get additional kind of legal protections to, to you know brownie points basically right hey they're trying to do what they can but ultimately this is about the individuals and their speech and not holding the platform accountable that was excellent thank you feel smarter I'm gonna add two things to that um, one is that it was necessary to have Section 230 in our country and not in a lot of other places around the world, or so we thought at the time. We'll get to that later. Um, because most other places have a loser pays rule for liability, and we have instead 
um, wild tribes of trial lawyers and ambulance chasers. So when they tell you it's a special carve out for tech companies, maybe, maybe that's not the whole story. The other fun fact about one of those lawsuits was it was the firm, the real life firm from the movie um, The Wolf of Wall Street. It turns out they were lying and the case was wrong like that. But if you've ever seen that movie, that's them. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about, now we know Section 230 said, hey, it's you posting the content that's speaking and is liable, it's not the platform that's carrying it. When those lawsuits existed, it was like message boards on the internet. It wasn't the social media world that we have now with all the social media platforms. But I think it's fair to say it wouldn't have grown up that way if it hadn't been, and we wouldn't all have the opportunity for 25 different places to speak on our phones that we do now. Um, but now, of course, it's under fire. So um, for tell, tell me a little bit about how Section 230 has come under fire, how it's been eroded, and there, there's a carve out you can talk to us about. And then tell me what you think the actual consequence to speech, controversial speech, might be if we did curtail Section 230 or repeal it. For sure. So uh, it seems like, at least for the first kind of like couple of decades of Section 230, it was sort of non-controversial. Like what you just read, those words, um, were critical in the foundation of how the internet was able to grow. Uh, but on top of that, um, like it was just seen as normalcy, right? Like there wasn't actually a call to, to get rid of that. We should make Facebook responsible if someone sends someone else a threat on Facebook, right? If somebody brought that up in Congress, you just go, that's a preposterous uh, proposition. Um, and then along came Donald Trump. Um, and so in the past few years, there has been a lot of discussion, and I, I think appropriately so, about um, online censorship, where big tech companies are kind of, um, and I want to be clear that when I say that this is wrong, it's not necessarily that it ought to be illegal, um, but big tech companies uh, saying that certain types of speech, that, that certain political opinions, um, sometimes under the guise of misinformation, whatever, big tech platforms are sort of suppressing ter certain types of speech. Um, Donald Trump was among the first political figures to talk about this problem, um, but him and his movement came to what I believe, and I'm guessing all of us on this panel would believe, is sort of a misguided uh, solution to that problem, which is to reform or remove Section 230. So um, the logic goes, or the argument goes, um, on the parts of people who are calling for something like that, that if the uh, publishers or the platforms, if Facebook is censoring, if Twitter is taking down certain content, then in effect they're choosing what content goes up or down, and so now their role is more like an editor, right? So if, if a newspaper publishes uh, a story and it has defamatory content, it might be that the newspaper and the author are both responsible uh, for the defamation. And of course, if somebody posts defamatory content on Facebook, no one would argue that Mark Zuckerberg has defamed the person. Um, in effect, the argument that many populist conservatives are making today is that uh, indeed, if there's censorship going on, they're making editorial decisions and therefore all content on the platform should be treated as the speech of the platform, whatever kind of remains. And so their argument goes, if we remove Section 230 or we create an exemption that you lose 230 protections if you censor, uh, then therefore censorship will, will stop. That, that Section 230 protection is somehow like a handout um, and then if we take it away, this is going to stop the censorship. Um, I want to be clear, I don't think that that argument makes any sense, um, but that actually is a pretty popular line of belief right now, mostly among what you might call like national conservatives or like the populist right. Um, in fact, I think what would happen, if you, just, if you just got rid of Section 230, we're getting rid of it, or even if you applied essentially kind of the Trumpian position, which is uh, make Section 230 protections contingent on uh, equitable speech online, um, I think the result is that you'd have a lot more censorship. Facebook, YouTube, if they were to be held liable for every single thing that is put on the platform, they would remove way more stuff. Or they might just shut down altogether because how can you possibly police everything that goes onto the platform? 
Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but since you cited like what would be an example of a carve-out that's already happened. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet we can think of an example yes. of why you think that might happen. Yeah, so there actually was a uh, bill that I believe it passed 98 to 2 <laughs> um, in the Senate. It might, might be 97 to 2, whatever. Um, almost unanimously in the Senate, uh, you had FOSTA-SESTA. And this was a bill that basically removed Section 230 protections in the case of a very specific crime, which was um, sex trafficking. And so they basically, there is now a bill that, or it's now law, that if a platform basically is where sex trafficking is occurring of some kind, then, uh, th then that platform can be held responsible. So for example, Craigslist itself could be held like liable for what goes on on the platform. The actual result of them doing that is Craigslist got rid of all personal ads, right? We're not doing we're not doing dating anymore because of the possibility that people might engage in nefarious activities that we're not um, pushing. Um, I actually had a freelancer who filmed a demonstration recently of sex workers in Los Angeles, and they were talking about how the outcome of FOSTA SESTA was even sex educators online were being removed from platforms because it's even peripherally looks anything like the subject of sex trafficking. They, they don't want to engage with it because they could be held criminally liable for what other people are touching. So in this one very like narrow topic of human sexuality, um, when you add a, a carve out to 230, for a very specific actual criminal act, all kinds of actually legal speech ended up being censored from online. So if you get rid of 230, uh, in general, I, I imagine that essentially speech will be all but foregone, disappeared uh, from the platforms. I would imagine the same. Thank you. Um, okay, so speak to us for, of a world without Section 230 and without built-in constitutional protections for free speech. Yeah, I think um, you might know a thing or yeah, two yeah. about that. Yeah, just just had one or two experiences. Um, so uh, as soon as I got to Washington, I, I went straight to the White House and took a photo with this this shirt on. Uh, for those in the back, it says "Too much 1984, not enough 1776." Uh, and I'll explain by the end, you'll understand the reference if you don't already, I'm sure many of you do. Uh, but I've actually recently reread 1984 because I was getting behind in the news and I wanted to catch up on current events <laughs> because Australia is very much 1984 and we are living in the Ministry of Truth. During COVID, things really accelerated. Australia was already, I would argue, on a path that I certainly as a libertarian was not thrilled about, but during COVID, it really accelerated. What we've discovered since the end of COVID is that during COVID, the Australian government through the Home Affairs Department and through our intelligence agencies identified uh, 4,213 different posts on Twitter alone. We don't know about the other platforms that they then requested for Twitter to take down. And in almost every single instance, they complied. Now, these posts included things that were posted by elected members of parliament. And in some cases, these were posts of videos of things that were said in Parliament by our elected members. But our government and our intelligence agencies deemed that they were not suitable for Australian eyes. And that's one example of what happens when you don't have uh, a, something like a, a First Amendment. But coming to Section 230, we have proposed in Australia a thing called the Misinformation Disinformation Bill. Yes, Trump derangement syndrome has made it to Australia. Uh, and, you know, fake news, oh no, if he's going to call us that, well then we're going to censor anything that has anything, any whiff of not being the official government line. What this particularly nefarious piece of legislation does is it holds the platforms specifically responsible if they allow anything that has been deemed misinformation or disinformation to remain on the platform. And the fines and the penalties that are levied at a corporate level are utterly absurd. They're done as a percentage of revenue on the platform. And if you do the maths on something like Meta, it would translate to a couple of hundred million dollars per offence. And that's deliberate. It's absurd, but it's deliberate. It's an intimidation tactic. And what they're actually wanting, this is not a defect, this is a feature of this law, is for these platforms to simply not allow anything controversial to be said. Why take the risk? Why would you as a platform take the risk? Let people talk about how funny kittens are when they fall off a bed rather than talking about anything substantial and, and, and anything that, that anyone might actually have any controversial views over. And that's actually the purpose. Now, what the government does in this bill is it specifically exempts itself. Funnily enough, it doesn't exempt politicians, it exempts the government. 
which, which in a Westminster system, that's basically one of the political parties um, using taxpayer money. And it exempts uh, established mainstream media. Now, as someone who runs uh, the Aussie Wire, which is a, a, a micro-alternative media uh, place in Australia, uh, of course, I'm not protected by that. It's only, it's only the big boys, the ones that have media licenses. So it's the government and the people the government gives permission to. They can say whatever they want. But the rest of us, well, we won't be allowed to, not because they're suppressing our freedom of speech. You understand, we're not suppressing your speech. This is about regulating the platforms. But the whole point is, we won't be able to say a thing. So, kind of talk to us a little bit about what is misinformation? And who is in charge of deciding what is misinformation? Well, th <laughs> these arguments, I think, are especially compelling because, you know, you had said before that, that if Section 230 goes away, then speech is, like, all but gone. And now we have, you know, your story told from uh, Australia. And, uh, and the reality is that speech is never going to go away. It's just a matter of whose speech is going to be ordained or blessed as the, you know, authoritative speech. So when we say that speech is all but gone, it's, it's for the people like you and me and people with micro-alternative websites that are trying to challenge mainstream narratives. Uh, I, I think back to Operation Mockingbird. Any, you, anyone familiar with Operation Mockingbird? we got a few heads nodding. This is when the CIA for decades was influencing the media by buying off journalists. And it was revealed in the 70s in the Rolling Stone magazine uh, where it was laid bare the efforts to which the government went to try and co-opt and control the narrative. That is ultimately... Uh, what this is about. When we're talking about the repeal or the restriction of Section 230, it's really just all subterfuge because those who are pushing for this are really trying to consolidate power so that the traditional mainstream media can continue to control the narrative. They will be sufficiently large and resourced with lawyers and everybody else to monitor everything and have official, you know, they're, they're just regurgitating press releases from the government half the time anyways, right? So they're staying within, safely within the bounds of, of what the appropriate uh, thought and speech are. But they're large enough to comply. Your micro alternative website is just probably just you or maybe some friends and some, some folks helping you. And so many of us on our social platforms, and it's just us, with our, we don't have lawyers, we don't have people to review our speech. Misinformation ultimately is completely subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder. And the greatest purveyor of actual misinformation, especially if we look in the past few years, is the government itself. Mm -hmm. And so why would we want the government to be the sole arbiter, uh, like when we had DHS and the, what was the lady uh, that, uh, she was like the queen, the czar of misinformation? Yeah, she remember? Was the, the information czar. <laughs> can't remember her name, but you know. Good. Yeah, yeah, her. yeah, bury her in the uh, ashes of history. Uh, but this was an effort on the government's part to say, oh, we need more, more arbiters of information to come in and tell us authoritatively what is misinformation. Well, oftentimes, uh, what the government calls misinformation is actual truth, uh, and therefore all the more reason why we need protections for the little guy, the Davids, who want to challenge Goliath and challenge that mainstream narrative. Excellent points. Okay, for, here's the deal. We're going to talk a little bit about, there's a current Supreme Court case this term, and I will spare you all the details, but hey, federal government, <coughs> stop harassing platforms and asking them to take down misinformation. Um, and then one of the counter arguments is that the government said, what about our right to free speech? So my question to you, does the government as we see in Australia and as we hear about here pushing back, have a right to free speech? Is that what the First Amendment was designed I, to protect? <laughs> yeah, she so said I leadingly. I suppose the, the Supreme Court will decide whether they have the right or not, but in terms of like, should they, um, <laughs> well, I we'll think I'm that. able to make a more assertive stance. So um, there, there has been a trend that uh, I would encourage everyone to read the Twitter files um, and if you are in a big tech platform or something, then uh, become a whistleblower. <laughs> Try leaking. <laughs> um, <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, that have what they've kind of shown is that in the past several years, and I'm sure that it's gone on a lot longer. Like you mentioned, Operation Mockingbird. I mean, I think that this sort of thing has evolved, not disappeared. Um, but what we've seen is that like the <clears throat> FBI and other federal agencies have actually attempted to influence the policies of social media platforms by giving them nudges where they'll send a list of uh, tweets that they consider to be um, disinformation, meaning intentionally this is meant to mislead people, misinformation that's wrong dis uh, regardless, and um, 
probably most complicated of all, there's this definition of malinformation. Information that's right, but it's bad. <laughs> um, the, and I, I hear you laughing, but this is an actual designation that was testified, uh, again, by Matt Taibbi in front of the Weaponization Committee in Congress, talking about how there were individual cases, somebody saying, for example, that um, like anecdotally they had had some kind of a reaction to a vaccine or something, it might be their true experience that they're truly tweeting, um, but the government would argue to Twitter, you should take down this person's personal experience um, because uh, it could lead to an undesirable outcome, regardless of the truth uh, or falsehood of the statement itself. Um, so as you got to the question, there, there's a legal question that's happening now, and it will be argued in front of the Supreme Court, which is basically, is the government sending nudges to social media suggesting you ought to take this down, um, violating the First Amendment? Um, so the government's claim is that they have, they have a right to make suggestions. We can just reach out to someone and inform them, we think this is violating your terms of service, or we think it's wrong that you're hosting this. Um, that's done in a government capacity, but if it's not force, if it's not a, an order, then uh, we're not violating the First Amendment. In fact, stopping us from doing this would violate our First Amendment right to tell you to take down speech. Um, I, I personally think that once you are endowed with a government badge, right, once you're part of a government agency, I don't think that this, like, floofy, like, well, we're, we're not forcing you to take it down, we're just nicely asking. Um, I don't think that that holds water. Um, but a, a counter argument that they have made is that, um, you know, the social media platforms have not always complied with those things. Depending on which exact example you're looking at, there's varying percentages of the time that the platform actually ends up doing the censoring that the government requested. Um, and so again, I'm not actually sure how that Supreme Court case would turn out, but I would definitely suggest that there's already a chilling effect on speech by the government suggesting that platforms take things down. Yeah, I think, um there's always sort of this underlying wink wink of like, sure is a nice social media company you have there. Right. Be a shame if something would happen to it. It'd be a shame if someone regulated it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could talk to the FTC, DOJ, or repeal of Section 230. So I think there's, there's a lot of that in the background. But I was encouraged to see there was a lot more pushback from those companies than I expected when you read through the Twitter files. They, they fought it a little harder than I I, I would have thought they would. The FBI also, in some cases, reimbursed the expenses for taking down the contest. It's casual. <laughs> um, no, so, nothing to see here. Again, I, in Congress, I saw there being debate about this, like, well, they, they were just reimbursing man hours to do it. They weren't paying them to censor. But again, these incentives become complicated. Can I just make a comment on uh, on this kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge? Because in Australia, it certainly stopped being a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and it became a five o'clock um, battering ram through your front door. <laughs> um, every single law has violence built into it. The only thing that changes when you make a law is that you've authorised the use of violence, right? If you if you don't like something, you can lobby, you can protest, you can speak to people, you can educate, you can do everything. The only thing you can't do is shoot somebody or arrest them and incarcerate them. But the, when you write a law, you change that. So in Australia, I spent two years fighting criminal charges and others that were alongside me during the, the movement, the pushback against the lockdown, spent time in prison. Uh, most notably, a, a young lady by the name of Monica Smith spent 22 days in prison. That doesn't sound like very long, but let me tell you a, a fraction about her story. What they did was they arrested her and they applied bail conditions. Now, there was no need to even arrest. They could have given her a, a summons to appear at court later on. There was no need for the arrest. It was all intimidation tactics. But what they were doing specifically was using bail and misusing bail, and this does have relevance to what we're talking about here, to silence people. And so they would apply bail conditions that said, you have to shut up, you can't talk anymore about lockdowns, about vaccine mandates, about any of this sort of stuff. And in her case, they said she had to shut down her political party. So this was direct political interference by the Victoria Police on behalf of the government of the day. And she had to shut down her bank accounts and a whole bunch of other stuff. And the, the deal is, if you don't sign the bail conditions, you go to prison until you can find a judge that will change the bail conditions to something that you're willing to sign. So she spent 22 days in prison, and because of uh, the, the, the paranoia around COVID at the time, she spent 22 days, or al almost all of those days, in solitary confinement. Something that you're not even supposed to do to, to, to spies and to war criminals and this sort of thing. Uh, and finally, after 22 days, a judge basically threw most of the bail conditions out and, and made a much more reasonable set of bail conditions, and she signed those and she was released. I fought for two years against criminal charges because I spoke and said, hey, we need to be protesting here. 
So what this comes back to with Section 230, with all of what you've seen, with what I talked about before, with, with the government taking down um, Twitter posts 4,213 times, is that everything the government does and says has the threat of violence behind it. I don't care how much they say it's a request. Absolutely everything they do has the threat of violence. And if you don't believe me, try saying no for long enough. The only reason it didn't come to violence in the case of the social media companies during COVID is because they eventually said yes often enough to keep the government happy. Okay. Well, we're going to, on that upper, <laughs> tr in, in true but terrifying news, do we have time for a question or two? We have five minutes. Look at you. First one. Click on the draw. You win. Thank you. Um, so there's another case about Section 230 coming up regarding whether or not states can uh, kind of finagle some additional regulations into through the federal ones. Um, I think one interesting aspect about this is the notification requirement for platforms. Um, so I run a website that shows Reddit users where they've been shadow banned. Uh, shadow banning, of course, is where you write a comment, somebody else removes it, but it still looks to you as if it's not removed. I find that this is very common on Reddit. Almost every account has some kind of removed that they don't know about. Um, and I wonder whether you guys uh, how you guys feel about uh, platforms' use of shadow bands? Mm -hmm. Anyone? I can you don't have a microphone. Yeah. Well, well while, he's, while he's getting his microphone, I'll just briefly say, I mean, what's Elon Musk's thing right now? He talks about, like, your, your guaranteed speech, not reach. Um, I think a lot of people are seduced by this idea that, like, okay, we'll pat you on the head, you can post whatever you want, but we'll just, you know, throttle your reach and make it so that you can't actually do it. I think there's a lot of danger in that because I think it's just kind of a... Uh, working around the system to still censor, and so I think it. I think I don't. To me, the solution is really just transparency. Like what you're doing sounds awesome, shining a spotlight on it. If it's truly problematic, then that does make sense to maybe like uh, remove ads and the, like they have on Twitter, the ability to profit from you know problematic content, things like that. But I think a lot of the people who are saying, "Oh, we're just limiting reach," are really just still trying to censor, but not look like they're actual censor. After January 6th, uh, which I covered in a filming journalistic capacity, my entire Twitter account at the time uh, was labeled as potentially sensitive images. Basically, it was uh, marked the same not safe for work way as uh, an account posting pornography or like extremely violent material, something like that. Uh, would be marked, and it wasn't just on individual, oh, there was some tweet with blood or something like that. It was every single tweet for the course of five months, but a completely unappealable decision. And I actually managed to get a hold of someone at Twitter um, asking journalistic contacts, like, who, who can I contact, whatever, and I got a response from them where they attempted at first to say, maybe it's something in your settings, right? Like, they actually outright denied that what is happening right in front of me is happening. And then I sent a screenshot back of what all my settings looked like, like, no, this is on your end. They never replied, but a week later, it just went back to normal. <laughs> and uh, what we learned, again, from the Twitter files is that they have tools on the back end where there's actually certain types of um, mark the whole thing as NSFW, not safe for work, um, as well as they had other, other tools like suppress certain types of like how visible it ends up in people's timelines. Um, search suggestion ban is another big one where um, f during that time period, you could type my name into the search thing, but it won't enter the drop down menu as if I'm not there. So you, you have to manually go to the URL of my Twitter account to find it. It's there, you just wouldn't find it unless you're actually specifically going to it. Um, that changed a little bit post Elon, and I think that there was some visibility to it because of the Twitter files, but that hasn't broadly changed across the internet. I don't think that there's a legal reform that's really, I don't, I don't know the path to like, a law that says that you can't shadow ban. I don't know how you would write that. Um, but as a matter of within the company policy, it's something we should advocate for is transparency about enforcement mechanisms. Okay, two minutes. This means if it's a statement, don't do it. <laughs> if it's a real question, I'm here for it right here. I was just really gonna ask, what are your thoughts on the um, platforms being forced to collect personal data on websites like Pornhub and things like that. So then therefore, of course, they shut down their sites. Like, for example, Pornhub is banned in Virginia and a bunch of other states. What are your thoughts on that? Pornography, go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In 30 it's seconds. Not, no, I mean, the topic's not pornography. The topic is, is the harvesting of data and, and the requirement yeah. uh, for the harvesting of metadata. I, look, Coming back to Section 230 and including that question, Section 230 should not have needed to exist. 
And the idea that a government can turn around and say to a private organisation, you are going to collect and provide us with this data on demand, should be unthinkable. And this is where I come back to this. There is too much 1984 and there is not enough 1776. You guys have lost the spirit of rebellion. You guys have lost the, may I say, FU that you had once upon a time. And now, there's a lot of talk, and especially on the conservative side, there's a lot of, like, they know how to talk a good game. But in practice, what's happening is we're seeing this continuous progression down this road where everyone's going, oh, yes, government, no government, whatever you say, government. And the only thing that actually stops this, the only thing that limits the power of government, and you can look through all of history to see this, the only thing that limits the power of government is when the people reach the limit of their obedience. And so for as long as you guys keep going along with that, and I know that some websites have actually said, well, we're withdrawing services from Virginia as a result of this, that's at least a step in the right direction. But for as long as you guys comply, it gets worse. Okay, Topher's going to face paint you for war in the lobby out front after this, so line up in an orderly fashion. I'm sorry, please stay and ask them questions. I'm volunteering them, but I have to wrap it up because they're going to shut off our microphones. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for participating. Thank you.